details from right outside Mar-a-Lago. Ellison. Hi, Ebony. Yeah, that's right. We're told President Trump was briefed on this. We're also told that there were no protectees in the White House at the time that this occurred. They're saying that there seems to have been someone with a who self-inflicted a gunshot wound along the uh, White House North Lawn, along the north fence of the White House. They say that that person is receiving medical attention. No word on their condition. But again, President Trump has been briefed right now. He is getting ready in the next hour or so to speak to a group of RNC donors last night he was here having dinner with donors uh, from the RNC and that is what he is supposed to do a little later today is speak with them and that's not going to be an event that is open to the press but after that he is then expected to head back to DC where he will attend the gridiron dinner which is a dinner uh, that takes place in DC every year that's one of the oldest journalism clubs the gridiron club President Trump did not attend this dinner last year but he will attend it tonight and that's a dinner where oftentimes the president is roasting and in the past, the president has chosen not to attend similar events like the White House Correspondents Dinner. But uh, for the White House, this week really is ending uh, with some heavy criticism for the president in regards to that uh, tariff proposal that he made public this week from world leaders to members of his own party. There are lots of people saying that they don't like it. President Trump is on Twitter now defending it. That's something we've seen him do a couple of times of late. Uh, the White House, the week for the White House also ended uh, with a a lot of palace intrigue and denials of staff shakeups. The White House is pushing back on reports that economic advisor Gary Cohn could be leaving very soon because he is unhappy with the president's tariff proposal. They're also pushing back on reports that NSA advisor H.R. McMaster is about to be forced out. Look, General McMaster's not going anywhere. Uh, as the president said yesterday in the Oval Office to a number of the people, he thinks he's doing a great job and glad he's here. Um, look, I was making a joke just before we started. The chaos uh, that I see most this morning, I left three preschoolers and a bunch of flashlights with the power out at my house. Uh, it was pretty chaotic and uh, certainly far more chaotic early this morning than when I got to the office. There's questions today? Communication director Hope Hicks announced this week that she plans to leave her job at the White House in the coming weeks. She made that announcement a day after she had testified before the House Intelligence Committee. Hope Hicks was one of the president's closest advisors and one of his or the longest serving advisor to the president. The White House says her decision to leave is something that she had been planning uh, well before that testimony. Uh, so here in Florida right now. Again, the president has been briefed on that shooting, but we want to reiterate there were no protectees at the White House at the time that occurred. President Trump will wrap up his events here and then head back to D.C. for a journalism dinner later this evening. Ebony. Thank you for that, Allison. And you have very safe travels back to D.C. as well. Looks pretty windy out there. All right, the Florida State Senate wrapping up a rare Saturday session as they examine stricter gun laws. Formal vote expected soon on $450 million in additional school security. Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi joining us now. Nice to see you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, first things Hi. first, you guys have the votes? Excuse me, Leland? I, I said, did you have the votes uh, to pass this both in the House and the Senate? I know this is something the governor's behind, you're behind, everybody else uh, getting behind we better. it. We better, and we have victims' families behind it, too. Um, um, Andy Pollack has been one of our champions on this, Meadows' father, and Bill Galvano has it on the floor of the Senate right now as we speak. And not only do I want it to pass, I want this to be unanimous. This should be unanimous because this is about protecting our kids. And our governor has worked so hard with Richard Corcoran, with Bill Galvano, and it, it, with President Negron. All right, it's amazing how quickly things are coming together in Florida. You've got a proposed You've got bills in the House and Senate. You've got what appears to be bipartisan support. It seems like Congress right. could learn uh, a few things from that. But uh, you think? first, yeah, no kidding. Uh, first things first, though, on this uh, raises the age uh, for someone to be able to buy uh, a rifle or a shotgun to 21. Um, right. It also has uh, these restraining orders that can be put in place uh, to essentially take people's guns away. Does this also close the gun show loophole and some of the background check? loopholes or does that have to come from the feds? It, it does not have to come from the feds in Florida. You know, we have tried this in the past and it hasn't gotten anywhere. I'm, I'm, well, what do you mean? I what have you, what have you, this what have you, what have you tried in the past that hasn't gotten anywhere? To close the gun show loophole because there's no waiting period for gun shows. I know that's been attempted in the past, but now 
we're living in a whole different world in Florida. You know, we just had 17 kids gunned down and 3,400 who are psychologically affected. So um, I, I'm not sure about that particular point, what's going to happen on that. It's evolving as we speak. But what I know is going to happen, something very important, a gun violence restraining order. We've been doing all the legal research on this to be sure it's constitutional. When someone is civilly committed in Florida, it's called a Baker's Act, Baker Act. But law enforcement can take their guns as they should because they are a danger to themselves or others. Upon release, if law enforcement wants to give, keep the guns, they must go before a judge, I think within 72 hours, in order to keep those guns. And that provides full due process mm -hmm. to the person who has been um, civilly committed. You said, so we have you said to make it constitutional. Right. I think everyone agrees with that. But mm -hmm. you know, G Rick Scott has been a champion on this. This is you a $450 million package, almost half a billion dollars, because Florida's in the black. We have saved our money, and now it's going right back into our schools mm -hmm. where it should to not only the mental health component, what but is at schools, every school will have a mental health trained guidance counselor who will work as a team with a teacher, with the administration, as well Madam as General, infrastructure, meaning securing much, our schools physically, the buildings, bulletproof Madam, glass, Madam Attorney General, and I, I, school resource officer I appreciate it. Let me just get in one question every 1,000 students okay. in a school. So it's going to be a comprehensive uh, plan a, like nothing a, we've ever seen. And I'm really proud it's of everybody a, it's a lot of things. Let me get in, together. Let me get in this a question isn't a partisan here. issue. Uh, it, it, you know, so you're going to have the people out there that want to get in one question, completely. That's not okay. going to happen. So everyone needs to come together. They need to work together. That's what Senator Galvano is preaching right now on the floor of the Senate. Okay. And I think this bill should be unanimous. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, we, we appreciate that. Let me try to ask you a question, though, about this $450 million. Uh, what does it specifically do to deal with the issues uh, and the failures of law enforcement that allowed this shooting to happen? Well, well, that's a separate investigation. Of course, um, the FBI is looking into what happened on that end, and the governor, rightfully so, has called an investigation into the Broward County Sheriff's Office because now we know there have been multiple calls to them that that went unanswered, multiple signs. And so I'm going to uh, okay, be me, working very closely uh, again, with Florida Department so does, of Law Enforcement it, on that. Ma'am, let me ask you this. But does, does this bill, does the $450 million, is what's going through the Florida House that you're championing, does it specifically address any of these law enforcement failures? Well, what it's going to do is prevent them in the future. And and what, what I have how, how does it How does it prevent them in the future? How does, how does this hold, speak hold on. to... I'm going to tell you, and we're really okay. proud of this. We're patterning it after Michigan and Colorado. I've been working closely with that. Sean Reyes in Utah mm. has one as well. General yeah. Kaufman in Colorado. It's an app. And this app is going to be incredible because kids now, we all know, are on Snapchat, Instagram. That's where all these reports, Leland, are coming in for the most part. Right. And I let 10 of the students from the school name the app it's going to be called fortify fortify florida it's written right into yeah. it they designed the icon so they can in real time and with the condition of anonymity report it we have the funding listen yeah. to this for this to be monitored okay. 24 hours a day seven days a week through a central right. clearinghouse mm -hmm. where there are going to be no excuses okay. for this happening well, again con conceivably there shouldn't be any excuses for the fbi tip Agreed. line being missed or uh, the oh, many calls agreed. of the deputies uh, either so hopefully uh the, the monitoring on the app is better than that thank you ma'am we appreciate it thanks leland mm -hmm. have a good day uh, ebony mm -hmm. now for a response from the other side of the aisle we're going to bring in michigan congressman dan kildee congressman thanks for joining thank you and glad that you were able to get here safely right well, certainly that was not the easiest thing over the weekend pretty windy so you heard the attorney general uh, speaking with leland about some pretty comprehensive measures that are going through uh, the florida senate and house of representatives right now being championed by herself and their governor both Republican, right? Uh, we also saw the president uh, saying some things earlier this week that many were shocked uh, and in awe about, talking about taking guns and having due process later. We'll see where the president goes with that. I now want to play you a piece of an interview that Leland had earlier with a Republican congressman, Francis Rooney. Let's take a listen to what the congressman had to say about this issue of gun control. Certainly Parkland's got to be a game changer. 42% of all mass shootings involve people that uh, had exhibited warning signs and red mm -hmm. flags. We've got to get these background checks in something like these restraining orders in place. Now, going over the facts, Congressman, we, we hear that Republican Congressman talking about background checks, closing loopholes, uh, raising the age of gun ownership with rifles and things like that to the age of 21. 
Now, respectfully, I won't ask you to speak for all Democrats, but it has been a rallying cry for Democrats since the Trump administration began to resist. Will you be resisting these proposals? Not those proposals. Those are proposals that many Democrats have been pushing uh, for a long time, closing the background uh, check loophole, for example. And I, and listening to the Attorney General in Florida talking about how they would try to do that at the state level, it won't work if we do this on a piecemeal basis. At the federal level, we need to close the background check loophole, the gun show loophole, and have universal background checks, which I think most people actually thought we already did, 40% or something. Let so me the ask guns. you this on that that point. Uh, again, going back to Leland's interview with the Attorney General, Florida at least seemingly able to do something that Congress has co consistently struggled to do around these issues. What can you and your colleagues, both Republican and Democrat and Independent, in Congress uh, do in order to replicate some of these seemingly universally accepted ideas around background checks and the like? The only thing we lack is a chance to have a vote on the floor. You know, I wrote a Who bill. Can lead that? Uh, the Speaker has to uh, have to step up and put the legislation on, on the floor. I have a, a bill to deal with bump stocks that I did with two Republicans and two Democrats, a really thoughtful approach uh, using the National Firearms Act. That bill would pass, and it would pass overwhelmingly. So this seems to be, you know, just me as a layperson congressman looking on the outside in that there seems to always be bipartisan units, right, that can get behind a piece of legislation, whether it's a bump stock, whether it's raising the age limit, whether it's a more comprehensive background check, yet it's always interrupted. How, how do you all in Congress get over that hump, that political hump? This is, well, there's two ways. One, the leadership changes their mind and allows these bills to be put on the floor. Or enough Republicans sign something that's very often not used, a discharge petition. If members of Congress sign a petition and a majority says we want a vote on a piece of legislation, that bill goes to the floor. So Republican members who are frustrated with their own leadership that b these bills haven't come up, they could go to the floor. We have two discharge peti uh, petitions right now pending on the floor. If they're that anxious to move and their leadership is not willing to put the bill on the floor, they could sign a discharge So that's petition. legislative. Uh, let me ask you something that doesn't involve new legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly every time a Parkland uh, incident t like that happens, Newtown, Parkland, uh, you know, certainly any of these mass shootings, it seems to be this call for more legislation, more gun control. But we know the facts in Parkland are a bit different in the sense that there were multiple times that there were, were, were a, was awareness on the part of how dangerous this individual was right. and, and what type of harm and damage he could do ultimately taking all those young lives. What do you say to the response, Congressman, that this kind of incident shows that we don't need more gun control, we don't need more legislation around this issue, what we need is the proper enforcement of existing laws? What, yeah, what I, I understand that, but I don't think it's any one thing. And I think it's a, it's, it's a dangerous path for us to go down to think that there's one solution. We do need better uh, gun legislation, no question about it. But we what, have some gun legislation here that would have prevented a lot of this. For sure. But we need to, we actually need to utilize those tools. Law enforcement needs to be held accountable. The fact that the FBI tip line follow through was not there is part of the, of the problem that we see here. But, but it's not one or the other. I think we actually have to both have a good legal structure that gives law enforcement and our society the tools to protect our citizens, particularly protect our kids. And then we have to hold those responsible for enforcing those laws to actually do their job. Congressman Kildee, thank you for coming in from Michigan safely for us. Leland. Thank you. All right, Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker now declaring a state of emergency as a powerful nor'easter continues to pound his state. So far, thousands of canceled flights, roads shut down across the Northeast, countless power outages. Brian Yenis live. Uh, thankfully, uh, we got you inside today, Brian. <laughs> that's right, you know, because it's not only the travel havoc that's talking about, but there are still many families that are dealing with this storm. As you mentioned, Governor Charlie Baker in Massachusetts declaring a state of emergency this morning that will expedite federal dollars to that state to help in the recovery. And what we're talking about is some 376,000 people in Massachusetts without power right now. They were particularly pummeled by this nor'easter. This morning, the National Guard evacuated families from Quincy, Massachusetts, and these families were there through the night, and high tide came out.
at midnight last night, bringing in some 13 feet of water. And about noon today, they expected that high tide to also bring some 13 feet of water into the communities. So people were evacuated. And coastal Massachusetts communities like Quincy and Situate have been hit extraordinarily hard by these floodwaters, submerging homes and cars. 80, 90, 80 to 90 mile an hour wind gusts have knocked out power lines along the Cape and the coastal communities after they endured. Remember the so-called bomb, the bomb cyclone two months ago. This is a back to back hit for that area. As for the travel chaos, there were some 3,400 flights canceled nationwide yesterday. Today, that number is about 569. So there is improvements here at LaGuardia. About 46 flights were canceled in the morning. Yesterday, it was 600. So again, improvements when it comes to travel, but it'll probably take the weekend for it to get fully back to normal. And it's not just air delays. High wind advisories closed down bridges all along the East Coast. Look at this video. This is a truck that nearly was tipped over its wheels off of the ground because of the wind on the Tappan Zee Bridge in New York City. Some 45 to 60 mile an hour wind gusts there. And if you look at this video, this is an airplane that was uh, taking off actually from Reagan National Airport. You can see the wind just whipping that plane to its side. That is scary as it was taking off in the air. And also there was another airline, the Southwest flight, Southwest Airlines flight that tried to land at Dulles International Airport in DC yesterday. It had to abort in the final moments and it landed 10 minutes later because of the high winds. The wind also caused really bad turbulence. This is what a pilot said on an official record log for the National Weather Service about his United Airlines flight. Quote, very bumpy on descent. Pretty much everyone on the plane threw up. Pilots were on the verge of throwing up. So that just gives you an idea of how bad it was with the winds yesterday. And again, it is still very much recovery mode. As we saw in Massachusetts, we're bringing the latest on what's happening there as that storm makes its way out of the, uh, out of the United States. Brian Yenis at LaGuardia. Brian, thank you. Uh, we heard that report from Brian about what the pilots were saying. It reminds me of that old line when there's a flight delay, which is you'd a lot rather be down here wishing you were up there than up there wishing you were down here. Oh, certainly. So, yeah, we're glad yes. you made it, by the I way. I was going to say, and I wish that uh, we'd had this report from Brian early with a, a woman who was very smart to say, happy that they canceled yeah. the flight because I'd rather be down here. I was a little more stubborn. Can you believe I was at LaGuardia right where Brian is right now yesterday morning trying to make it here to D.C. to be with you this weekend and dedication uh, right here de well and all of our Fox News colleagues I mean yeah. I've heard some stories about people traveling over the weekend so I'm thinking no way you cancel my Delta flight right no way mm -hmm. you cancel yeah. uh, you know my, my Delta if you're here. watching yeah, just, there yeah. you go uh, and and then my Amtrak you know I was on the last Amtrak that actually went south from New York City mm -hmm. so it was really uh, everything working in tandem to get me here safely after that they Planes, canceled trains automobiles sure. all right well that's dedication thank you for being here no, thanks thank to Amtrak for uh, uh, finally getting you through. Absolutely. Thank you. And still ahead, from serving our country on the battlefield to going for gold for the U.S., we'll talk to one wounded warrior now answering the call at the Paralympics. And the latest details in the Russia probe send shockwaves through Washington. 25% tax to imported steel and a 10% tax to imported aluminum, in part to counter other countries such as China overproducing steel and dumping it into U.S. markets. President Trump says he's trying to save the American steel industry and to fight back against an $800 billion trade deficit. The president just tweeted this a few minutes ago, quote, the United States has an $800 billion yearly trade deficit because of our, sorry, this can't read the tweet right now, because of our very stupid trade deals and policies. Our jobs and wealth are being given to other countries and have taken advantage of us for years. They laugh at what fools our leaders have been. No more. The details are expected to be released next week, and it is possible there could be carve-outs that exempt certain countries from these tariffs. But free trade Republicans say tariffs are not the answer. Utah Republican Senator Mike Lee called the tariffs, quote, a huge job-killing tax hike on American consumers. While I am sympathetic to the issues facing domestic steel manufacturers, there must be a better way to address the steel industry's concerns. And I hope Congress and the executive branch can identify an alternative solution before these tariffs are finalized next week. The United Steelworkers Union says it's been fighting for action like this for decades to ensure that, quote, cheaters are held accountable. But that labor union also represents some steelworkers in Canada and is asking that Canadian steel be exempted from these tariffs.
Ebony? Thank you, Molly. Certainly many more details I'm sure will follow exactly how this uh, tariff situation will unfold. Thank you. Leland? All right, let's bring in Trip Miller for a little bit more on this. Trip, good to see you. Appreciate it. Uh, Friday, the market sort of stabilized. They were even, which I guess is the new up. What do you think the president's tweets are going to mean uh, come Monday morning? Well, this is obviously a very resilient market, and it seems like, you know, points of, of influence in the market, like we saw coming a couple of days ago with the news of the potential tariffs, you know, have a big impact in the short run. But in the long run, we're in a very strong bull market with, you know, low unemployment, high consumer confidence. And so, you know, the, the president can tweet all he wants to, but this economy continues to tick right along. And he's done a lot to boost this economy in the last year with the tax cuts. So we don't look for that to change in the short run. In the, in the short run, at least, nobody is really defending uh, the president on this. We can see him sort of defending himself, if you will, on Twitter about these tariffs, but Republicans in Congress uh, running from him in the Senate as well. Uh, Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, though, uh, came out uh, with this reason that people shouldn't be concerned about a trade war. Take a listen. There's about three cents worth of tin plate steel in this can. So if it goes up 25%, that's a tiny fraction of one penny. That's not a noticeable thing. Uh, my friend David Asman at the Fox Business Network made the point that uh, Nancy Pelosi got so much criticism for calling a $1,000 tax break crumbs. But if you add in the cost of a trade war to the average American consumer, it goes way more than $1,000, even if you just take a look at what right now is on the table from the Europeans and the Chinese. Trip, do we lose you? You agree with that? Disagree sure, with that? No. No, I, well, I, I, when, I, when I look at this, certainly, you know, when we look at trade and you look at tariffs, um, you know, a trade war would be negative for everybody globally. And I think it's very interesting, you know, that so many people on the Republican side have come out against this. Um, you know, major industries from Boeing to the major car manufacturers on down have said, you know, this would be a real negative, not only for them from a revenue standpoint, but potentially, you know, for their employees as well. So I think that this is really a negative for the U.S. economy um, if it were to last. You know, again, in the short run, we'll see is this positioning from President Trump. Uh, it could be. He's a pretty strong negotiator. Um, and so we think that this could just be posturing. But over the long haul, we would hate to see a trade war globally kick in. And obviously, you know, what has been threatened from European countries uh, sends the signal yeah. that if we strike, they're going to strike back. Well, and so, so many of the president's defenders are saying, look, see how this plays out. This could be a play uh, for leverage. The president announced the tariffs. They haven't gone into effect yet, uh, much less some of the retaliatory uh, tariffs. Big picture, though, uh, everybody's got a 401k, pensions for unions and for teachers and for police officers are all uh, invested in the stock market. Is it time for people to worry yet about this? No, I think the real message is don't panic. If you're a long-term investor like we are, stay focused on owning great businesses and buying those companies on the dip. You know, if you'd invested in the market just a few weeks ago, you would have done fairly well coming off of that 